Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, and thanks everyone for attending today's webinar, Federal Energy Policy Impact of the 2020 Election. Um, I'm gonna turn it, this is Jack Jacobson. I'm gonna turn it over really briefly to the chair of our energy group, Adrian Clare, um, to give introductions and then I'll do some housekeeping. Adrian. Thank you, Jack, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jack said, my name is Adrienne Clare, and I'm the chair of the Energy Group at Thompson Coburn. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar on federal energy policy impact of the 2020 election. <clears throat> this is the first in a two-part series for us, so please look out for our second session soon after the election when we will hopefully have some sort of resolution. Uh, an even greater pleasure for me is that I will briefly introduce my colleagues and then get right out of the way for our session to start. Our speakers this afternoon are Jack Jacobson and Kyle Simpson. Jack has a wide range of public policy and strategic communications experience in regional and international law firms and public affairs firms. He's worked with clients on a range of matters to effectively engage Congress and the administration in terms of energy. Jack was a lobbyist at a boutique energy environmental and, and environmental and energy firm, excuse me, specializing in public power, natural gas, and nuclear issues. He has continued representation on energy issues and others for clients that have included a natural gas research consortium, a major energy efficiency manufacturing company, and a public power system. I can say from personal experience that it is a thing of beauty to watch Jack strategize on who can help our clients best and how to get them to do just that. Kyle Simpson, our second speaker, is a problem-solving advocate who seeks creative solutions to connect public policy and business realities. Kyle has experience in corporate, government, and private practice and brings, to that, experience, brings that experience to bear on energy issues. He has served as Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Energy and Associate Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Energy. In that capacity, Kyle was responsible for the energy, natural gas, oil, and coal, and nuclear energy industries. Kyle now, Kyle now works with clients to implement workable incentives for carbon capture utilization and storage, as well as energy projects including LNG export facilities and climate-friendly electric power generating systems. For my own purposes, beyond knowing everything about energy in Washington, Kyle also knows everyone in energy. It would take a very short time for him to show immediately and how quickly he could win the six degrees of separation in an energy game. With those two introductions out of the way, uh, welcome to our, our session this afternoon, and I'll turn it back over to Jack and Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for those kind introductions. Um, I'm going to, this is Jack again, I'm going to start with some housekeeping items. Uh, so if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them to the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer these during the webcast at the end, but if a fuller answer is needed or we've run out of time, uh, it will be answered later by email. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. We'd encourage you to download this for future reference. You can help find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. If your screen freezes or you encounter other technical issues, pressing F5, this was a new one for me, pressing F5 will refresh the screen and fix most problems. If you continue to have problems, uh, send us a note using Q&A widget, and um, we've got a couple of staff on here that can assist you. The webinar is CLE accredited in California, Illinois, and Texas for one hour general CLE credit, and in Missouri for 1.2 hours of general CLE credit. We award CLE based on attendance for the entire 60 minutes. From time to time, you'll be required to click a pop-up screen to reflect your continued engagement. We appreciate your participation in the course. So Kyle and I are gonna go through this. Uh, we've been working together for over two decades. Um, and so we're gonna tag team it a little bit and uh, jump in on various slides. But today you'll see us go through what the federal election looks like, some analysis and prognostication on um, Senate and House seats, and of course the presidency. Then we'll go into what uh, the pre president's second term might look like in terms of policy and forecasting. We'll look at major shifts then in the Biden administration, including climate change, and, um, and then we'll get into some more granular uh, differences between uh, Trump 2.0 and President Biden. 
let's start with the fun stuff, the election analysis. Democrats need four, need to get four seats um, if the president wins re-election or only three seats uh, net if Biden wins because the vice president would then be the tiebreaker. We have only really two vulnerable Democrats at the moment, Doug Jones from Alabama and more recently, Gary Peters from Michigan. Um, Republican senators, on the other hand, are defending seats in Arizona, Colorado. Both of the Georgia Senate seats are up. Um, Iowa, Maine, Montana, North Carolina, and very recently, South Carolina as well. Uh, so Republicans are certainly on defense. Um, based on historical data, we'd expect that whomever wins the presidency, that party to also control the Senate. House is a lot less exciting. Republicans would need a minimum of 18 seats to take control of the House. But both sides right now have about a, a similar number of vulnerable House members. Democrats might have a little edge there, but we don't expect control of the House to change. Presidency, obviously we need 270 electoral votes to win. You'll recall that four years ago, the president lost the popular vote by 3 million but he also won the Electoral College uh, 304 to 277. And that was that those Rust Belt states of um, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, that really put him over the top. And Minnesota almost helped him. Republicans do hold an Electoral College edge, but right now all the polling indicates that Biden holds a very strong lead in the popular vote and probably a lead in the Electoral College. It depends on how bullish the prognosticators are. We'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. But this is a chaotic election. We've all seen what's happened just in the last two weeks uh, in terms of seismic shifts uh, with 19 days to go. Many things could still happen, although early voting uh, and mail-in voting uh, is is starting to bake in uh, the election results already. So again, uh, Senate, uh, Democrats need four seats. And the last time uh, Democrats came close to that was in 2008 when Barack Obama won and Democrats beat five GOP incumbents. And here's just a handy map of where the competitive seats are. Uh, most recently, South Carolina was moved from lean Republican to toss up by the Cook Report. And Alaska and Texas went from likely Republican to only lean Republican. Sleeper races, certainly Alaska, Kansas, Michigan, um, maybe Alabama. Doug Jones has just been phenomenal in fundraising, but it's a super tough state for him. So Jack, if you, if you look at the Senate, and <clears throat> there are about eight seats really that uh, could reasonably be expected that Democrats have a chance to pick up uh, only one in play for the Republicans. If you split that difference down, down the middle, you end up with a 52-48 uh, majority for the, for the Democrats. Uh, for the polls, if you, you've got Cook here, if you look at Larry Sabato, or you just take the overall sampling from Real Clear Politics, um, the president's trend lines are going up, and if history tells, then the, the Democratic uh, Senate pickups uh, could be greater than expected. You bet. And in the, we're seeing the same. Um, we'll, we'll see a similar trend here. Uh, there aren't a lot of competitive districts left anymore, um, so we're going to not see big shifts in the balance of power in the House. Here for the House ratings, again, we're looking at Cook Political. Um, if you look at the seats that are likely or lean Democratic, four of those are open Republican districts. And then in the toss-up seats, uh, Republicans have more um, at-risk seats than Democrats do. Uh, there are a couple of sleeper races, again, um, in Alaska, Don Young has been pulled pulling down one or two points. And, you know, for instance, in Michigan, uh, Fred Upton, who's a ranking member on the Energy Committee, uh, is facing a really strong challenger. So I think there are some 
there could be some surprises in here. But again, we think we're going to have Speaker Pelosi again in 2021. And in the states, Kyle, do you want to talk a little bit about the states that are that are up for play? I think this differs a little bit from um, Larry Sabato. Uh Yeah, so this was uh, Cook's scenario is uh, two, 290 Biden and Democratic uh, Biden-Harris. Uh, see, Sabato is a little more conservative and has a down around uh, 230, I believe, uh, 226, which would mean he, they, the Democrats need to secure 44 additional to get to the 270. Uh, he has Trump at, a, at only 125, however, compared to what Cook has. Uh, so the toss-ups in the in a Sabato poll are 187. Um, the, for the telling thing there is that uh, uh, Biden Harris would only need 44, and Trump would need 145 of those 187. Uh, in order to uh, pick up, uh, win the Electoral College. If you watch the campaigns, both sides of what's going on right now, um, you're seeing President Trump having to go travel to states like Iowa and Georgia to defend what should be strong, solid Republican states. And you're seeing uh, Vice President Trump uh, go into those states uh, where that are more uh, challenging for Democrats uh, have been historically recently more challenging. So you're seeing a, a, a trend that's, that's, that uh, is pushing uh, more of those uh, uh, electoral votes probably towards the Biden camp. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, it's really, really stunning that even, for instance, Texas may be in play um, at this point in the game. So what can we look for in a second Trump presidency? Uh, frankly, we're looking at more of the same. Uh, we, we likely see the Senate remain and uh, we see the same that we've seen the last two years of shared party rule uh, in Congress. Uh, the president would continue to use and expand his executive powers to achieve his policy goals rather than going through Congress and having to deal with legislation. And the president would probably also focus more on social issues as he has for the last four years. Issues like immigration, um, abortion, law and order, uh, that sort of thing. And then the federal judiciary would continue to bend more toward uh, the conservative side of things, uh, as we're seeing with the Supreme Court hearings over the past four days. Would Trump's cabinet look the same? Probably not. Uh, he said, um, this is a couple months ago now, but he said, I wouldn't say I'm thrilled with everybody, frankly. Uh, in the energy sphere, uh, we think he's pretty confident in the energy secretary along with the EPA administrator and the interior secretary. Uh, the commerce secretary, Wilbur Ross, would probably be replaced. Um, Elaine Chow has been pretty effective at transportation. And then would the president reappoint permanent cabinet members? Maybe, but he's evolved, he's evolved to really like acting um, department heads and acting positions. Those don't require Senate confirmation, and so they're easier to be named. Now, if somehow the president wins and the Senate is Democratic, um, which is an unlikely scenario, but still possible, of course, uh, that would that would almost certainly lead to more acting um, appointment roles and a lot of congressional hearings on what on the constitutionality of that and the appropriate right. Uh, yeah, Jack, on that, I, I think I mean it's an unlike historically it's an unlikely scenario where if President Trump win that the, would that the Dem Senate would go Democratic. But in the event that occurred, in the scenario you just described, uh, I think we would see a really a real challenge to the functionality of the of the cabinet uh, positions, and if if they don't move to try to confirm uh, the actual cabinet members, 
um, and those confirmation hearings would be very contested. Yes. Back to you. Exactly. Um, appropriations. Uh, again, with a Republican Senate and the president's reelection, we'd see more of what we've seen over the last few years in terms of appropriations. Um, slow but steady increases um, in spending across the board. Now, this differs greatly from the budget that the administration has put out, particularly in the energy and environment world. The president's budget over the past four years has sought to slash agency budgets. Um, at the end of the day, though, all of those budgets are being increased year after year. So that disconnect is something that we haven't seen historically, and the president doesn't really seem to be fighting for the budget cuts, um, even though he's proposing them. Yeah, at the, uh, at the Department of Energy, for instance, the president has proposed every year to reduce the uh, R&D budgets for energy, uh, except in the area of fossil energy, but for energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, to reduce those budgets substantially. And the Congress has consistently uh, increased those budgets. Uh, they haven't underfunded the or reduced the funding for the fossil energy office, but I think uh, that trend, should President Trump be reelected, would continue if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, and particularly if the Congress becomes Democratic. I think we'd see enormous spending increases on ener clean energy technology research and development. Exactly. And uh, with that, uh, a COVID-19 emergency funding measure, uh, if, if, well, regardless of the election outcome, I think we're going to see a big emergency funding measure. The president's been asking for one in recent days. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has been pretty clear and her caucus has been clear about what they want. Um, they've run into some, some headway, headwinds in the uh, Senate. But we'd expect an emergency funding bill, particularly under Democrats, to focus a lot of resources to energy and environmental issues. On infrastructure, uh, it's a mixed bag here. The, the president has been saying for four years and, in fact, said leading up to the election in 2016 that he wanted a major infrastructure bill. But he hasn't been able to figure out how to fund that in a way that is palatable to Republicans. And Democrats, for the most part, um, would prefer a package financed by debt. Um, so nothing's been happening. It's infrastructure week every week, and yet nothing's happened. Uh, a highway, the highway bill was just extended for a year. Uh, that expired, the current authorization expired on September 30th, but an emergency one-year stopgap is now in place. Um, one thing that I would expect to see by the end of the year is reauthorization of the Water Resources Development Act. This is a really popular measure that funds water projects and Army Corps projects. The House passed its authorization back in July, and it was so popular, they just passed it by voice vote. So that means there's practically no opposition. The Senate um, Environment and Public Works Committee reported a bill in May that's that's bipartisan, has a lot of support. They haven't gotten floor time yet, but I, I believe there are already negotiations between uh, the committees on what a final bill could look like, and that could certainly be seen by the end of the year. The president, in his second term, would continue to focus on the economy. That, that's been his hallmark over the past four years. Um, he has rather boldly injected politics into the actions of the Federal Reserve even, uh, effectively putting pressure on Fed decisions. Uh, he wants to continue economic growth. He's going to do what he can with his executive pin to cut regulations. And he's going to take, um, he's going to take credit for any more economic stimulus packages uh, that would pass. Additional tax cuts are probably off the table as long as Democrats hold the House of Representatives, which they will continue to do next year. And in terms of energy, the president's going to continue to tout American as America as the world's energy superior country. 
Um, he's focused most of his policies, his public facing policies on fossil fuels, as Kyle mentioned earlier, um, including R&D on things like coal, oil, natural gas, and carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, he's expanded natural resource extraction on public land. And he wants to finish the withdrawal from the Paris Accord, which due to some technicalities can't be completed until after the election. And he's been a supporter of nuclear energy. Um, Yucca, he's gone back and forth on a little bit. This is where we got to start to see some major changes um, if Biden is elected. The vice president has said that he wants to be a generational bridge, meaning he wants to move from where we've been energy-wise to where we're going to be, which is zero emissions or net zero emissions, um, renewable energy, energy storage, etc. cetera. Uh, climate change is going to be one of the hallmarks of what he's going, how he's going to base his policy decisions. It's going to be related to carbon emissions and climate change. And that's everything from armed services to the Department of Energy to um, NOAA and science and everything in between. Uh, everything is going to be viewed through a climate lens. But and I, I, I think that will go on to the U.S. Trade Representative, the State Department of uh, Justice. You'll even see the Department of Defense getting uh, pressure in this in this area. Um, it'll be a major, major issue. And another major issue that that Kyle in particular is focused a lot on is environmental justice. Um, do you want to talk about that for a second? Well, I think the. Uh, we will, there will be, you'll see a pattern through this presentation as to where the Biden administration it will head, but the progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party has been pushing on environmental justice. Uh, there have been many, many lawsuits uh, uh, that have come along, and, and the investment community in the U.S. and in, in the world, and when I say the community, from, from shareholders to the big investment banks, are moving uh, more and more to view investment portfolios and the performance of companies with uh, uh, environmental justice and ESG, the environment, the social and governance uh, policies. So I, I think that this is uh, uh, that issue will be larger and more broad than it's been viewed in the past. And then there's been a lot of discussion recently about the Green New Deal and trying to put some light between Kamala Harris that supports the Green New Deal and Joe Biden that doesn't. Even though Biden doesn't specifically support the Green New Deal, a lot of the values and goals of the Green New Deal are going to help drive a lot of Biden policies moving forward. So this is super key here. Uh, there was a big rift in the Democratic Party um, at the end of the nomination process where Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders didn't agree on a lot of the Democratic priorities, but they made a concerted effort to come together uh, after the primary and really work to, to consolidate support around the nominee. Uh, they put together a unity task force that made tons of policy recommendations to really focus on the climate crisis and environmental justice. This is a 100, 100 plus page document. And what it really ended up doing was bringing the environmentalists into the same camp with uh, labor and making sure that goals were aligned. And at the end of the day, all of the green pieces of the Biden Sanders unity position also are going to help the labor, uh, help labor be successful. That's things like Davis Bacon, um, wage requirements, uh, and and other labor goal, policy goals on a federal level. Yeah, if, um, you, if you, I was just going to say a little bit, Jack. If you feel back the onion a little bit on this, on these positions, uh, and you look, a good example was how the climate policy 
uh, in the Biden camp was was finally agreed to. And there was a nine member group that that he appointed. There were at least six uh, Biden people and three Sanders people. It was uh, a strong influence in the progressive uh, uh, from the progressive wing of the party. And this is going to be a real challenge because the environmental and progressive side leans more towards just let's move immediately to clean energy. Let's move to renewables. Let's, and, and it has a, this is my view, a tendency to uh, not take into full consideration the need for reliability uh, and some other things that um, are necessary. Um, the uh, labor unions uh, want jobs, and the labor unions will, interestingly, be uh, uh, less intent on moving so quickly to uh, dramatic change. So you'll see conflict there. Everything moving to the clean side of energy, but uh, not to the point where um, it becomes impossible to uh, permit important energy projects. Exactly. And I'm going to let you play here because, as Adrian said, uh, you know most of these players in the energy world, but uh, Biden's climate advisors and potential appointees are, there are just a ton of op options out there. I think a couple of things to be cognizant of in terms of advisors and appointees the environmental and, and um, more liberal wing of the party has been really adamant that fossil fuel executives and, and lobbyists should not be up for appointment. I think he's still getting some advice from folks um, in the background. And that's super important uh, because fossil fuels are going to be a mix of our, our energy and electricity uh, portfolio for the foreseeable future. Um, and Kyle, you know a lot of these folks that you've worked with them, um, well, when they were in the Obama administration or previously in the Clinton administration. Do you want to talk about some advisors and appointee options? Well, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. And in, when you said about appointing somebody for a cabinet position, uh, there, people have different views. It should be an expert, some people think. Uh, some people think it well, obviously it needs to be a governor or somebody with a political constituency. Historically, it tends to be people with political constituencies. So if you go through this list and look at who those people are, uh, a Governor Jay Inslee from Washington has a strong political constituency from the progressives uh, and has and, in, and when he served in in the House, uh, a room. <laughs> Majumdar is a brilliant man, as is Ernie Moniz. Ernie's a former energy secretary, so I wouldn't see him as a potential for a, for an energy secretary. But he, I know, in fact, that he he is interested in the idea of a, of the climate czar position. He would get tremendous opposition from uh, from the progressive left because uh, Ernie uh, Secretary Moniz's views are all of the above. Um, Arun was the director of RPE, big on R&D. R um, Michelle Lujan Grisham, the governor from New Mexico, is a real rising star on the Democratic side. So when you balance the need for uh, women and uh, minorities in the cabinet, she would step forward. Uh, I think uh, uh, Karen Bass would be an interesting uh, uh selection in that in that regard as well um, so there everybody in this list it's a fascinating list when you start looking at it and I don't think I could guess which one if any of them would actually be appointed but it's a good representative example of the types of people that will be considered at interior uh, you've got uh, uh, Senator Heinrich from New Mexico uh, you've got uh, uh, some other, uh, he comes straight forward to mind. He's Tom Udall, the retiring senator from from New Mexico, could be uh, a person there. And then EPA, I just am not sure at all who it might be. But um, that one may tend to be more, less political in their track, in their pedigree, 
uh, and, and more uh, 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 non-governmental organization oriented, I would think. Jack? Yeah, and I think one of the, the key things that we don't want to lose here is, as you mentioned, uh, Vice President Biden has committed to having at least 50% of his cabinet be women, and he's really working um, on making sure that it's balanced racially. You know, he is, his campaign was criticized early in the year for only having about 35% of his staff be people of color. As of, I think, today or yesterday, I saw it's up to 46%. So uh, he's really focused on diversity issues as, as well. And there is a ton of talent um, that is diverse uh, that he can welcome into uh, his administration. Uh, Vice President Biden's entire plan right now is the entire election mantra is to build back better. This is what it's all about. He's, he's proposed $2 trillion in economic recovery money. Uh, some of that would be through repealing some of the Trump tax credits, closing loopholes, which is a very vague term, um, and additional debt. I guess it'd be closer to a trillion dollars in debt and maybe a trillion in tax cut rescissions, but uh, it's going to be a combination thereof. This would also include funds for municipal governments and state governments to ensure that they have the resources they need to continue to provide uh, basic services. We'd, be, we'd see an investment in American manufacturing especially in terms of supply chain. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into cybersecurity in a couple of slides. And looking at sustainable infrastructure, everything from roads and bridges, the energy grid to broadband. And all of this would be looked at through, again, the clean energy lens. So the plan is also to achieve carbon-free power by 2035 and a net zero economy by 2050. On nuclear energy, um, the, the vice president hasn't really focused on nuclear energy, although it's still going to be um, in the energy mix for quite some time. There is uh, a plan to accelerate investment in small modular reactors. And, you know, our current nuclear energy fleet is attractive because it's very low carbon. I don't say it's zero carbon because there are transportation issues that, that produce carbon. There's extract, resource extraction issues that produce carbon. So if you're really looking at it from a, a cradle to grave, um, it's almost no, no emissions, but it's not zero emissions. Uh, big question is whether credit for existing nuclear would be allowable. That's unclear at the moment. Uh, and Yucca Mountain would be opposed by a Biden administration. Infrastructure, uh, the $2 trillion, a lot of that is going to go into infrastructure investments. This is everything from roads and water to transit. Um, even schools would count. Uh, airports, rails, ferries, ports, broadband. Uh, the broadband vision is really holistic. The vice president would like to bring broadband or wireless broadband by 5G to every single American. Uh, there are about 1,500 school districts right now that don't have uh, broadband, and a lot of those, in fact, are in Alaska. But that would be one of the core um, core goals of the Biden administration in terms of transportation uh, infrastructure. Go ahead. Oh, that's, yeah, so I did, didn't mean to interrupt, but I think the broadband issue is going to be elevated tremendously. It's It's been, a, in some cases, sort of a sleeper issue in in the in the back because many of the telecommunications companies uh, have been reluctant to move broadband and make it available uniformly across, uh, uh, across the United States. But this COVID experience that we're going through uh, is is really emphasizing uh, the 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 difference between communities and people that have access to broadband and those that do not, and it's creating an education divide that I think is going to uh, bring this issue really to the to the forefront. So as people who 
serve you know communities for electricity or gas and utilities and what have you, uh, I'd watch for this one to really rise up pretty quickly. And then in terms of public transportation, uh, every single municipality or 100,000 or more people would have a public transportation system or the ability to get a pub support for a public transportation system under the Build Back Better plan. Um, there's also a big focus on water systems and the security and safety of water system. And then a big investment in electric vehicle infrastructure, including a half million new charging stations across the country. And as we see Tesla and a lot of competitors coming up with uh, new electric car options that are affordable, uh, those charging infrastructure is going to be super important. The Biden administration will also focus on environmental injustice by um, making sure that air pollution is reduced in disadvantaged communities and that disadvantaged communities would receive the lion's share, well, almost, 40% uh, of investments at a minimum uh, to focus on clean energy, energy efficiency, transit, transportation, clean water, et cetera. The Biden administration will also establish an environmental and climate justice division within the Department of Justice uh, to specifically go after polluters. Climate change, climate change, climate change. Every, every major decision under a Biden administration is going to have a focus on climate change uh, and climate resiliency. Uh, we would see perhaps the appointment of a climate czar, as Kyle mentioned earlier with, with uh, former Secretary Moniz, uh, looking to position, looking at that position. But a climate czar, until Congress passes a major piece of climate change legislation, like they did with Waxman Markey in 2009, I think, or 10, in the absence of that, a climate czar would look across every federal agency and really dig down into how carbon mitigation could be achieved at every single level by every single decision that the federal government makes. Uh, it'd be a really neat position to, to create and would give Congress a little bit more time to come together on a major climate legislation. Yeah, Jack, to, to, if, if I could step, jump in, to give a little historic perspective, um, when EPA was, crea was created, when President Nixon created EPA, there were some, I don't know, 22 or 24 different agencies across the country, uh, I mean, across the administration, uh, federal agencies, that had jurisdiction for some aspect of, of the environment. And it's 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 totally unwieldy from a, a management perspective to have that many, to have any coherent policy going through and affects coordinated change. The, the president's office has an interagency process. It's usually run through the National Economic Council or, or OMB or the National Security Council um, to try to manage those disparate uh, interests and, and challenges. And it's not so much that the agencies have a different view or perspective. Their statutory requirements are all different. And they all report to different committees of Congress. So the, the push and pull makes it very, very difficult. Uh, the fact that climate has raised, has come to, to the top of, of the heap in issues, or near the top of the heap in issues, um, means that the administration will, if it is a vice president Biden's presidential administration, uh, would probably have, they will address that head on. Uh, and bring in a climate czar that would have cabinet rank uh, and a special position uh, in the president's power structure to try to manage those issues uh, going through. I don't know that it leads to a new agency, and nobody has really put that out there yet, but it's a path towards that, uh, that type of a decision-making process. Yeah. 
Exactly. And then additionally, all of the nominees for the agencies that you'd expect, FERC, Department of Energy, EPA, Interior, Transportation, all of those nominees are going to be looked at for their climate record and what they could do in terms of uh, carbon mitigation moving forward. But it's not going to be just limited to that. As Kyle mentioned earlier, trade and the U.S. trade representative is, is going to try to use that power to, um, to reduce carbon emissions. Department of State will do the same. Department of Justice having a real focus on um, what we're doing at the federal level and, and what we're prosecuting in terms of pollution. FEMA and NOAA would, uh, appointees would also be looked at through a climate lens. And generally, federal court appointees would even be looked at for their environmental records. Um, and there's, again, this tension where labor supporters are usually going to be focused on wage and job growth over cl climate. So that's going to be the tension that we see um, re probably really early on in, the, in a Biden administration. All right. An interesting uh, juxtaposition between the Trump uh, policies and the, and the Biden policies. Uh, the Trump administration uh, picked up on something actually that was really began to take shape in the Obama administration, which was to use energy policy as a uh, national security and foreign policy tool. Uh, you saw it really come to the head in the negotiations with Germany to get them not to approve a gas pipeline from Russia, for instance. Um, if, the, if it's a Biden administration, there will be a really aggressive move, uh, I believe, to use trade policy uh, to influence the, the uh, uh, actions and behavior of our trade partners and countries, some are not our trade partners, all around the world with regard to um, climate, including you know, border adjustment taxes for uh, carbon emissions and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, that leads to another issue which has been almost absent from the campaign, which is a carbon tax. Um, neither side has talked about it, but uh, I would watch for that issue to uh, emerge in the event that uh, uh, Biden is elected and the Senate becomes uh, Democratic. Jack? So FERC, um, what does a Trump administration versus Biden administration look like? Um, FERC currently has three commissioners, two Republican, one Democrat. So it's the minimum number to still meet a quorum. Uh, the president has nominated uh, a Republican and a Democrat to fill the two empty seats. And hearings have been held, but they have not been confirmed yet by the Senate. Um, if Biden wins, he would likely replace the chairman with a Democratic chair, and there would be a Democratic majority on, on the FERC. Um, there's some, some technical changes that we're seeing under FERC as well right now. Um, two of the current commissioners have requested a statutory change to extend the period for FERC to act on requests for rehearing under the Natural Gas Act and the Federal Power Act. Uh, the commission also recently held a day-long hearing or conference on carbon pricing, and it was generally agreed that FERC would have the authority uh, to implement a carbon price, but there was not as much clarity on who could initiate such a rulemaking. And I believe I saw earlier today that FERC has made the statement which does not take action to implement a carbon price, but states that FERC would be open to a carbon price inside RTOs and ISOs that it oversees. So this is a, this is a pretty big shift and something we'll, we'll want to keep an eye on over the next couple of years, regardless of who wins the election. Uh, uh, the election sorry, the, the... sorry we, Jack and yep. I don't have an efficient way for me to interrupt him, so I apologize. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, I would watch for FERC every decision uh, that they make to be influenced by greenhouse gas emissions policies. Uh, 
uh, that will rise up up to the front, and it will it will bring challenges. It will bring legal challenges as to whether they have the authority or not. Uh, but it it will be there uh, as part of their decision making process. Yeah, and the the last two bu bullets on this slide uh, reemphasize that um, in terms of natural gas pipeline approvals, do greenhouse gas emissions uh, calculations go into that pipeline approval process? And um, would FERC generally look to uh, make it harder to permit uh, natural gas related infrastructure um, moving forward? And those are big questions and things that we're, we're watching very closely. Water management, also huge. The president this week uh, announced a new water sub cabinet that is going to help coordinate and streamline federal decisions across agencies with regard to water. The electoral impetus, of course, um, is Western farmers that uh, want more water supply for their farms and groves uh, and, and their herds, of course. But more broadly, the order can affect everything from the Everglades to the Great Lakes to, um, to, to water sources across the country. Uh, the, the executive order looks to increase water storage, supply res reliability, and drought resiliency. For Mr. Biden, of course, we look back through the Build Back Better plan and the water infrastructure investments that he intends to make, which would also, again, focus on climate resiliency and environmental sustainability. And again, you're going to hear a lot about Flint and public water systems to make sure that, that they're safe for uh, municipalities. On the Power Marketing Administration, the President's budget has, again, proposed to sell the transmission assets uh, of, the, of three of the Power Marketing Administrations. We've seen that consistently over the last four years. Congress has rebuffed those efforts, though. And under the Obama Administration, uh, the federal government reviewed the efficiency of the PMAs and did not contemplate selling PMA assets at all. Uh, a Biden administration would likely continue to support the PMAs, and through the Build Back Better plan, we'd probably see upgrades um, to PMA facilities. Cybersecurity is a, a big issue and one that is less party-driven than security-driven. So uh, this is one of the places where President and the Vice President tend to agree a little bit more. Uh, earlier this week, the President signed an executive order uh, earlier, earlier this year, I'm sorry, I think it was May 1st. The President signed an executive order securing the U.S. bulk power system. Uh, this executive order puts the Secretary of Energy in the lead, and, uh, it, and the goal is to minimize foreign threats to bulk power systems. Uh, there's going to be a notice of proposed rulemaking expected later this year. Uh, the challenge is that the focus here with the executive order is really on procurement, and it's not a holistic approach to cybersecurity. It's just where are, where are the products from, and can we make sure that uh, the products that are purchased are secure? Biden's cybersecurity team would be more holistic in its approach and really would look to enhance the overall security and integrity of the grid. And the Biden administration would likely reinstate the White House Office of Cybersecurity. Uh, so the vice president's policies don't have anything specific related to cybersecurity and the energy sector. Munis and co-ops. Um, the Trump administration recently supported co-ops with DOE grants. Um, grants including bringing solar to low-income members and cybersecurity monitoring. Uh, you'll also note that uh, the Trump administration had allowed continued operation of coal-fired generation, uh, which would have gradually decreased under Obama's Clean Power Plan. And NRECA supported, I believe, the continued operation of these coal facilities. But Biden would also continue to support co-ops and munis through his Build Back Better program and would focus a lot of funds on research and green technology development and employment and deployment at broad scale. 
I'll let Kyle take this slide since he's been doing a lot of work here. So the environment, social justice, governance factors, the ESG policies, um, all of these things that we've uh, that have, we've gone through, uh, on particularly on the in the Biden policy side, relate to uh, an acceleration of activity in in these areas. Um, the climate change issue is obvious on the climate side. Uh, the social is issues with uh, the importance of racial justice, access to uh, and equity in the, in the workplace uh, and in civil society, access to education, uh, access to broadband, uh, for instance. And then on the governance side, um, the um, issues of how do, how do you, how are uh, entities held accountable for uh, uh, measured and held accountable. And there's a growing awareness that ESG is hard to manage, hard to measure. Uh, compliance with, with regulatory requirements on the environmental side are pretty not that hard, but uh, measuring emissions in many cases is. Uh, and actions of through the life cycle, Jack alluded to the, or talked about the life cycle a little bit of, of of products, for instance, is fairly hard to measure. Social issues can be very difficult to measure. Um, and then how, then if you can't measure them, how how is one held uh, accountable? So I think we'll see a Biden administration addressing much of that, struggling with it. Uh, uh, the current administration has um, uh, tended more towards a Milton Friedman economy mentality, which is business should be left to do business and uh, and government should not interfere with the uh, uh, more social aspects of things into their operations. You see that in the effort to roll back uh, environmental rules. Uh, you see it in uh, uh, a number of things. Uh, that would change dramatically, uh, and and then I think um, that will be visibly visibly manifested in um, uh, private sector investment banking portfolio uh, uh, evaluation of portfolios weighted towards ESG, uh, and they're already doing it. It's already a, a strong publicly supported move shareholder organizations you see them uh, you see uh, shareholder organizations challenging the environmental record of Exxon for instance and taking them to court over the uh, their actions on climate change through since the 60s uh, uh, you see uh, uh, special investment uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, the balance of, 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 of uh, diversity on boards. California has a requirement to have half the members of the of boards be women, I believe. You know, there, there's a number of these things that you see coming coming forward. Um, in order to address that, and then you know, Black BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink announced uh, earlier this year that their investments will take into account. Uh, actions of the companies that they invest in on climate change. Uh, Bank of America, the chairman of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, recently put together a group of companies, heavily weighted, I think, probably with the accounting firms, seeking to come up with a way to measure ESG. Uh, if, the, if the companies don't figure out how to do that, uh, there will be a tendency to want government to do that. So I think you're amongst certain people. And uh, if it's a, uh, this administration, if the Senate move is becomes democratic, these will be pressures that I think we'll see come forward. For uh, folks who are in, who rely on municipal bond financing, uh, those actions uh, by the investment banks, uh, to measure ESG will become an important part, or probably already are an important part of what, uh, 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 how you establish your, uh, your processes and implement 
things and manage your companies, but they'll become more and more important. Thanks, Jared. You bet. We've got about five minutes left, so if anyone has questions, type them into the Q&A as I go through these last two slides pretty quickly, um, which are committee changes expected in Congress. The appropriations chair is retiring, um, and there are three women uh, looking to uh, looking to take that slot. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, particularly on the Democratic side, on bringing back earmarks or directed spending as well. Uh, the current proposal is that no more than one percent of the budget could be earmarked, but um, Deloro and Wasserman Schultz have have established plans for this, and we expect Marcy Kaptur to do, do the same if, should she succeed. Um, the Energy and Commerce Committee on the Republican side, the ranking member is retiring, and the likely successor is Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington or Mike Burgess from Texas. On the Senate side, uh, Senator Murkowski, who is chair of the Energy Committee, is is term limited. She's been there for six years, and uh, her replacement will likely be John Barrasso from Wyoming. And if that happens, then Shelley Moore Capito from West Virginia would become the senior Republican on environment and public works, either as the chair or ranking member. And then our last slide is who would, who would chair committees in a Democratic Senate? On appropriations, very likely Patrick Leahy would become chair. On budget, uh, looking at Bernie Sanders, who's currently the ranking member, or Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island. Energy and natural resources, this is going to be a big fight. Uh, I believe Bernie Sanders has seniority, but Joe Manchin is currently the senior, the ranking Democrat on the committee. Uh, I think Bernie Sanders would likely give up budget if he could chair the Energy Committee. Kyle, what do you think? Uh, uh, there we go. Really Sorry, I thought I was I thought I was on mute, but uh, I think that <laughs> would be interesting having Bernie Sanders as chairman of the Energy Committee. That's what I think. <laughs> it would. The Budget Committee doesn't have a lot of. But has, doesn't have the same cachet or power that it used to. Um, so that would be interesting. On environment and public works, Tom Carper is currently the ranking Democrat. Uh, he could very easily go into a Biden administration. He's well, well liked and well known by the vice president. And that would open the top slot up for Ben Cardin from Maryland. And then in terms of taxes, Ron Wyden from Oregon would continue to be the senior um, Democrat and would likely chair that committee. We're always looking at surprises. Would some of these folks go into a Biden administration? Probably. Uh, what about what do you do about someone like Elizabeth Warren? She's not senior enough to chair a committee. Um, her seat would be replaced by a Republican, at least in the short term, it looks like. So would she go into the administration or would she get some sort of Senate leadership role uh, given given her stature nationally as a, as a well-known Democrat and an effective messenger for the party. Um, with Depends that, on the balance of the, balance of the Senate, for one, whether she would go <laughs> or not. It does. Uh, so fun things to think about, and, and certainly we'll have more prognostication on that immediately following the election when we do our follow-up webinar. Uh, we've got just a minute left. I wonder if we could take a question on, would a Biden administration likely pass an energy storage investment tax credit? So I think anything that's going to help us get from fossil fuels to non-carbon emitting energy is going to be on the table. There is currently an energy storage investment tax credit, but it's limited to solar energy. So basically, if you have a residential solar and you put a battery on it and power your house with that, you can get an investment tax credit. I think this could be, there are actually two, um, there's, there's a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate to expand the energy storage tax credit. 
um, and make it fuel neutral in terms of renewable energy sources. And then the proposal would also not necessarily make it be a tax credit, but it could also be a cash payment um, of up to 30%. So uh, certainly I think that's on the table. Um, with that, anything else? I'm not seeing any other questions. Kyle, do you have anything else to add as we close down here or Adrian? I, I do not. Uh, it's, go ahead, Adrian. No, I was just going to say nothing for me. I, I was glad, um, Jack, thanks for pointing out the commission announced today during its, its um, monthly meeting that they're going to put out a policy statement on carbon pricing. So thanks for that. Nothing further from me. Well, great. With that, um, I want to thank everyone for spending uh, an hour with us this afternoon and participating in our webinar. If you would take a minute, we'd appreciate it if you'd complete and submit the survey that's located in the widget at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will look forward to having many of you back um, in a few weeks when we do this again. Thank you.